Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. Now, welcome along. Much to discuss. If you haven't seen the news, by the way, the remaining dates for the postponed Women's Six Nations have been confirmed this afternoon. So Ireland, Italy is October 25th. That's going to be in Donnybrook. Donny, uh, Donnybrook, rather. Uh, one o'clock kickoff, and then the French game away. That's going to be over in Lille. That'll be November the uh, first, one thirty, Irish time. Those dates released this afternoon. Before all that, of course, Heineken Champions Cup semi-finals will take place next uh, Saturday. Racing will host Saracens. That will be on at La Défense, and then Exeter have Toulouse at Sandy Park. No Irish representation, of course. Only the fourth time since the turn of the century that has been the case. We have with us Liam, Far Liam uh, Toland. I almost called you Liam Farrell there. He's on the brain. Good evening, Liam. How are you doing, Joe? Very well. And Stuart Barnes, hello to you. Good evening. So uh, spooked was the word that Leo Cullen used several times over Liam Toland about Leinster's first half. Well, I think if you, if you, put a, if you kind of frame that 40 minutes of rugby and you look at what Leinster achieved in the previous few weeks against Munster and Ulster, they were able to control tempo, they were able to control the corridor power, and in certain cases, even when they weren't controlling the set piece, they could tr control the outcome of, of those errors. But for me, I know he didn't get mad at the match, but Maro uh, Atoje in the second row for, uh, for Saracens was just phenomenal. Like he controlled everything. He was the breeding heart of what Saracens brought. And in many ways, like Saracens is full of, like there's six, seven, eight, nine starting test lines players are certainly approaching that in the like, Saracens are a very good outfit but they their mean average of as a team isn't something that should frighten Leinster but but their control of tempo and their card or power was absolutely frightening and, and Atoje was just ruthless uh, and then you factor in the set piece and it really brings back the, the value of the scrum to to rugby doesn't it and it brings back questions around the role of the back row at scrum time uh, the Leinster back row we're more concerned about the, the potential of uh, Vinopola picking for eight. And as a former wing forward, it's quite a, a worry when you're when you're on the side. But you got a scrum first. And I think the, the Leinster front row really struggled. And I think if Tyg Furlan had been playing, that the seven penalties conceded may have been different. Uh, that said, uh, that 40 minutes was certainly, I, I didn't quite see it coming. But uh, if you took Toji out and you put Furlan in, maybe it a bit slightly different. But... It was a brutal 40 minutes from them. Yeah, seven scrum penalties conceded. I mean, not since the World Cup final, really, have we been so focused, I think, on the, role, the, the influence of the scrum in a game. That's a very interesting point you make about the role of the back row on, on Leinster's part, Liam, because there's been so much talk, understandably, of Vincent Koch and uh, Mako Vinopola. Surely, though, somewhere in the midst of that first half, if the back row were abandoning and ship, uh, with, you know, with good cause to you know, peel off, Early, surely at some stage when they realised there was a full-blown crisis in the scrum, they would have bedded down. No. Well, you think back to Northampton in, in the the final in 2011, and Mike Ross. Remember, Mike Ross was relatively young international at that stage, but he was 31 years of age as a tight head. And Porter obviously has a Grand Slam and many accolades, but he's still very much learning as a tight head. You know, he's relatively young in his career. That and minutes playing as a tight head is relatively low. Like he's. He wasn't a starter, an automatic starter last year for obvious reasons, Ty Furlong. And he wasn't, he, at times he was he was on the bench uh, and he got bit parts at the end. So there's a couple of things that need to be looked at in a way. At halftime in the Northampton final, uh, there was a real brain, scrummaging brains trust led by Mike Ross and the, the computer nerds were able to see what was going wrong and they were able to fix it. I'm not so sure that Leinster scrum, because that has been conceding penalties against Ulster and, and Munster in the last few weeks as well. So it, it isn't the perfect end product. But as a back rower, when you're scrummaging, uh, particularly in the oppositions put in, particularly when you got someone like a Vinopola, you, you've got to be very conscious of what he's doing. But the first way to disrupt him is to disrupt the Saracens scrum. And that requires you scrummaging. Mm. Um, and that requires James Ryan as a tight head scrummager, scrummaging and the whole unit of eight. And that's what why it's such a beautiful part of our game. It requires eight players working in unison for about 20 seconds to get it all right. And if you don't get it right, it brings the referee's interpretation into question. And certainly Andrew Porter, when he's playing for Ireland, 
or he's playing for Leinster. There's an awful lot of interpretation, and sometimes the penalties go in his way, in his favour, and sometimes they go against him. So there's a combination stuff, but certainly Connors at seven and Doris at six. You could argue in their career to this point, which has been on an unbelievable trajectory, they have never really had to scrummage as a back row. Maybe in their career, I don't know, I haven't gone back into the vaults, but it could be the first time where their scrum was really under pressure and they also had a number eight of Vinopola's calibre to worry about. Not just him, but then they have to be focused on the Saracens 10 and 12 and 13, so it might come down their channel as well. So there's an awful lot happening there. So I forgive Connors, but it could be an insight into schools rugby. I don't know about you, Stuart, but schools rugby in Ireland there's no real scrummaging going on. It's a one metre push. So there's a depowering of that whole concept. And a lot of top class players might find themselves in a quarterfinal of, of champions at European level, having never really scrummaged. And it's a, a brutal place to learn it. Yeah, um, there's no doubt at all. It was very reminiscent of uh, November the 2nd, Yokohama, except from an English perspective. Um, it would be perceived as a rather good 80 minutes. Uh, Vincent Cott was the uh, link between it all. He was magnificent. Uh, as you say, Liam, Toje was at the heartbeat of it. But I think also it was a, a, a tactical triumph for Saracens. Yes, it appears that uh, they missed their F a lot less than Leinster missed theirs, uh, Furlong and Farrell. Um, but one has to say, you know, geez, I was playing this game a long time ago, but if your scrum is going down and you're getting repeatedly penalised, the other thing you have to do is reassess how you're trying to play the game. Now, to me, I saw a Leinster team that were playing quite similar rugby to how England were playing in the very early days of Stuart Lancaster. When I was commentating for Sky, I used to bemoan the fact that they were going sideways, left, right, nowhere forward between the 10 metre line and the halfway line. And they would inevitably, against powerful teams, leak penalties. You leak penalties in your own half, you're liable to leak points. Now, at some stage, I'm disappointed, as well as the points Liam made, which I agree with totally about the set piece. Tactically, I, I feel that Leinster. Uh, in the shape of Sexton in particular, I had to say, hey, we're conceding penalties or potentially conceding them every time we get into a scrum. So, you know, it's not what we want to do, but we have to play this ball in parts of the field where the net result of a penalty ain't going to be three points against us because in a big, tight European match, if you're just going leaking three, six, nine, it's taking you away from the game and it's putting you under pressure. Had Leinster played less rugby in the first half, but they'd been 3-6 down, it could have been a very, very different story, especially with the fact that Saracens had very limited options on the bench in the last 20. But they left themselves a long way to go. So I, I would also say Mark McCall uh, macro-managed Saracens. They went in there knowing what they had to do in the broadest sense, and then were told to play the game. We scrum, we hit at the gain line, defence and attack, we box kick, we play them into parts of the field they don't want to be. Leinster, I felt that if there's a weakness in Stuart Lancaster, he, he sometimes micromanages. He used to say with England, you know, I work so hard on the players thinking for themselves, but they're not getting it. That's because if you coach in a certain way where there is so much in the way of sort of phase rugby, then it's very hard for players to actually divorce themselves from that micromanagement. And I felt that um, Leinster suffered in an English sort of way. And I felt that Johnny Sexton played very much like a lot of English fly halves were doing in the early Lancaster era. Stuart, you've raised a number of points there which fall uh, firmly into a theme, I think, which has arisen across these various Anglo-Irish games, Ireland against England and Leinster against Saracens. Yeah. When you use phrases like too much rugby in the wrong places and then players not thinking on their feet. I mean, immediately I'm brought back to Dublin 2019 and yes. it does not seem, for whatever reason, as if Irish teams, be that Leinster or Ireland against England or Saracens, are learning how to cope and think on their feet in these circumstances. 
like again, who was Ireland coach 2019? Uh, Joe Smith, a man for whom I have a huge regard, but a man who I think by the end of his tenure in Ireland was over coaching. And, and, and I think that's a potential weakness of Stuart Lancaster. I feel that sometimes Leinster looked like Ireland, but with more fluidity and more confidence and more flair. But essentially, they look a patterned sort of team. And that is a big problem, I think, for Ireland. The other major problem that, again, you know, let's link club and country, Leinster and Ireland. I remember Joe saying after that 2019 loss, he looked shell-shocked and he said, you've got to remember, England are full of big men. We can't match that. And he was talking about the Vunapola brothers. He was talking about Jamie George. He was talking about Maro Itoje. England is a country with a very large population and it's got a lot of big blokes and um with ireland with wales with scotland you know it seems that sometimes at the very highest level without that power it's very hard to win you have your moments but it's difficult to dominate and south africa who aren't a pretty team they take that power level to the world cup and they've got an amazing record and i would say you know um, watching my money go down the drain for the last four days, there's a parallel in golf with Bryson DeChambeau. He hit the ball so hard, the others weren't ready for it, and they couldn't adapt to just the sheer power. Now, golf correspondents and commentators are talking about a new era of golf. I wouldn't go that far. I don't know enough about golf. But again, it gets back to this thing about professionalism. Power is a potent factor. And Saracens, like England, possessed it. And Ireland, every now and again, look as if they're playing on the back foot without it. Liam, do you want to come in on this? Yeah, and I, I think to even add on top of that, Joe, you've got like the try that uh, Ali Scood scored in the first half. I thought it was one of the best tries I've seen. Like, Leinster didn't miss a tackle. So, the, like, the sense that I got when, when Saracens scored that try was that they laid a trap, building on what Stuart was saying there, that they just, they dominated the corridor power, they dominated the tempo, and they dominated set piece. Ironically, by the way, if you look at the stats, uh, both scrums were 100%, so Leinster had 100% scrum success at 4 of 4 yet conceded seven penalties, so I'm not sure how the statistician gets around that. But they have then the quality of players aside. I think Elliot Daly, I've always been an enormous fan at, at, at 15. Like, I, I wasn't aware of his outrageous kicking. We all had seen it, but the accuracy and, and just punishing, the punish, the, the emotional energy that takes from you as a home side, particularly when you've no crowd to kind of reboost you, it's it's enormous. Like, these moments are, are enormous. And that sense of physicality is something that we have to think our way around. Now, from time to time, the likes of Japan, and you know we were we were both in we were in Japan for the World Cup, like the, a nation like Japan have taught us that skills can at times beat power, not all the time, and certainly not if you have to patch five or six games together. And I think there's huge lessons there. But for me, the last number of weeks, the Guinness Pro, Leinster, were playing against two poorer sides in Munster and Ulster. And you, you obviously got the, the stad, uh, Toulouse game to talk about, but it, two poorer sides. And they didn't do a whole lot in order to manage those hurdles. They just simply soaked up the hits. And they used, you, you know, leading with Josh van der Fleer, who was just in Billy Byrne's face and just shutting down time and that. This was the first time. And, and I'd be slow to think that Leo Cullen and, and Stuart Lancaster were caught unawares by Saracens, but maybe the preparation through the Guinness Pro gave them a sense of comfort that we can manage and we can adapt our rugby because the rugby intelligence of the Leinster 15 is still, and I take Stuart's point about um, about um, Sexton at 10 and, and, and changing the, the style of game that was required in, in the first half, but the rugby intelligence at Leinster squad is still phenomenal. Maybe it is a time that just goes to show, like, you look at James Ryan, who's a relatively young, he's our hero, isn't he? But he was just blitzed by Mario Toje, mm. just physically, the power sense. So maybe it is a time again that we need to kind of figure out how do we drift away from the power game into something like Japan have taught us, a game that can actually get better outcomes. Because mm. every time we play against this type of power, we're coming out with the same result. The only thing is we've been having that conversation since about November 2019. And here we are. It doesn't look like we've massively moved on in that direction or even lean like they had something to go to. I mean, I mean, you accept Stuart's point that the power game was dominating and Leinster, in an Ireland-esque way, 
sort of ran out of ideas in that first half. We'll get on to the second half in a moment, but they shouldn't yeah, have allowed the you, scoreboard get to where it got to. A hundred percent. Like again, it's it's very dis like it's it's very very debilitating when your scrum goes. But the scrum has consistently not been perfect. You know, the line out in the last couple of weeks has not been perfect from a Leinster point of view. But I'd also kind of tip my eye. I'd be interested to see what Stuart thinks of Jordan Larmer's performance at fifteen because, again, Larmer's instinct typically, and he's and he's value add is when you kick a loose ball to him. And I think uh, Wiggles worked to be fair. There was precious few loose balls kicked. But his, his kind of instinct is to really punish you when the ball comes his way. And for some reason, maybe the entire squad were caught in the, in the headlights of what Saracens were doing in that 40 minutes. But there was precious little uh, natural flow back from Leinster. I'm not quite sure why Larmer didn't lead that way, but certainly his instinct was more um, uh, conservative mm. than it would have been in other games. And that's I, I don't know why that's the case. I'd be interested to see what, what Stuart would think of that. Um. I mean, I'm a big fan of Lama, but I think when you're part of a back three and the pressure is being applied, as it was by uh, Richard Wigglesworth, it actually gets quite daunting. Um, for my sins, I was a fly half come uh, full back, and, and I can recall <laughs> Eric Elwood having an amazing game with a boot in 1993. And, you know, my game as a, as a fullback was very much on the counter. And you just think, Christ, they're kicking well at us. And it, it intimidates you, I think. And I, I think there's that element to it. And I also think uh, with Lama, I, I think Lowe's very important to Leinster because Leinster are, they play some lovely rugby uh, against possibly physically weaker teams, but they're quite there's a pattern in the structure to their game and Lowe has this capacity he's a player who just plays outside that pattern he can burst it and change it and that's important for you because it's a talismanic quality that you believe that you can do all sorts of different things you're actually not doing and he was having quite a hard time of it and I felt that I loved the way Saracens via Wigglesworth and Alex Lewington targeted one of the, the most important broken field players in the Leinster game and made him look very ragged. And, and I just felt that it, it, it spread mm. there on from quite early in the game, you know. And, and I, Lama's a very fine player. His kicking game is, is improving. Um, I just felt he, he got caught up in a, in a game where Saracens were psychologically as well as physically squeezing Leinster. Mm. Sure, it didn't, you, sorry, it didn't help, sorry, Joe, it didn't help as well that when Leinster did put a bit of width on their game, like the turnovers conceded were huge. I think it was like almost double figures, over double figures, I think 16 to 7 or something in, in Saracens' favour. So any time that that ball was in any shape or form had ambition on it, it seemed that Saracens were able to, to eke out a positive result on their half there as well. So it seemed that not only was the set piece being punished, but any form of creativity that was relative, like of the of the games we saw at the weekend, the total meters gained by Leinster Saracens was the smallest of all the sides. Mm. So it was a very limited game that both Saracens and Leinster played, yeah. but it just so happened that it suited Saracens absolutely 100%. And they had that spark to score that try when they needed it, but ultimately they weren't here to do that. They were here just to beat Leinster up. Yeah, the ball was only in play for 30 minutes. Stuart, can you give us maybe the outsider's perspective on this? Because it feels like something of a reality check for yeah. the Pro 14 and for Leinster, I mean, to be slightly unfair to them, but if we, if we just kind of hone in, they were beaten in Newcastle in the final of Europe last year. In a very similar... What Liam was saying about a lack of, uh, a lack of metres made yeah. and quite a, a battling game, that final was very similar to the semi-final with Saracens dominating. Sorry, okay. yes. And then they go and they win 25 matches and yeah. they are very much on the front foot and there's Pro 14 cannon fodder, and we, you know, we have debates here in Irish Radio, geez, I wonder, are Leinster's second string the second best team in this competition? And we celebrate, Josh van der Fleer's had a billion tackles this week, and there's various stats, and they all look very good. And then when push comes to shove again, a crucial moment, uh, there's been no real progress, and they're, they're, you know, they are soundly beaten here. And so <laughs> much of the last year's Pro 14 rugby has gone from, it, arguably, and this is the point, that I'm putting to you has gone from being, you know, something of a, of a celebration of Leinster, and actually, you know, it's 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 just um, it just speaks of the Pro 14's weakness and a, and a, maybe a level of delusion here. 
Yeah, I, th I think so. I think it's a little bit like um, it's a little bit like National Hunt, you know. Um, a couple of small yards in England have a horse that rattles off four or five big hurdles wins, and they look great. And they go to Cheltenham, and then it's Ireland has all the big guns. Form line's very important. Um, I was interested in what Liam was saying earlier about the Ulster performance. I felt Toulouse, you've got to remember, it only played two matches this season since lockdown. Uh, they're going to be rusty. I felt they, they beat Ulster with more comfort than Leinster did. And I think that's a reflection on the form lines. I think it's it, it has not helped Leinster uh, winning all their games. And I think I was looking at the, the, the score lines. It was something like a 21-point margin average. You know, this is... This is huge. This is not the sort of background preparation you need to play big teams. Um, and I, I'm not a I'm not an anglocentric sort of person who likes to kick Pro 14. I, I really I love rugby. You know, I want to see it good everywhere I see. But what I've seen is uh, over the last few over years a lack of ambition and accuracy in the English league. Uh, in Ireland, in, in the in, in in Pro 14, more flair, but a lot less power. What's quite interesting since lockdown, four or five English teams have actually looked quite good, and you know I'll include Exeter uh, alongside Saracens with my old lot Bath and Wasps, and Bristol, and because they have this power, because they have this size, when they get that right they become quite a hard team to beat. And I go all the way back to, to Liam saying, well, what do we do about that? And say how Japan showed the way. Japan's way was to play with great accuracy, but at real pace. Now, if you look at Ireland, the, the, there isn't real pace. And in the World Cup, there was no pace. They played offloading, but it was slow as you like, and it was hopeless. And you take the power analogy, the one team who are not huge at international level are New Zealand. And, and how have they, in the 20 odd years of professionalism, dominated test match after test match as they do? Because the speed and the accuracy and the width of their game is like nothing else from any team. And South Africa can rein them back in World Cup finals, yes. But overall, New Zealand, uh, look at look at their rugby, the uh, the uh, Super New Zealand tournament, um, Aotearoa, sorry, it had left me for a second. It was played at a completely different pace to anything in the Northern Hemisphere. And that reflects on why New Zealand are a hard team to beat. They don't have the biggest, but they understand if you don't have that, you have to play outside power. Ireland can't do that because Ireland don't have the pace or the willingness to play outside power. Mm. Yeah, so uh, chastening to say the least. And um, well, look, a very brief, because I do want to touch on Ulster before I let you go, a word on what Saracens did, Liam, because I mean, it was, it was kind of vintage knockout rugby. If, if, even if for people who didn't catch the game as it unfolded, there, were, there was an exchange of penalties early and then nine minutes, Saracens go 6-3 up. 13 minutes, they go 9-3 up. 25 minutes, 12-3 up. 28 minutes, suddenly they're 15-3 up and Leinster are walking a bit of a high wire act and then bang, the good try. It's 23-3 at halftime, basically game over. I mean, it was utterly vintage. It was, and I, I'm, and I was sitting there. Obviously, we've discussed, you know, key moments like the the scrum and the back row, and that the the influence it had in not supporting maybe the Leinster front five. Uh, maybe Scott Farley's absence was was a was a small hindrance. Maybe um, the penalties around the breakdown, the turnovers were huge. Um, but the 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 attitude of what Saracens did, I was beginning to say to myself. If this was a normal season, Leinster would have navigated the, the Guinness Pro, but they would have had sprinkled in on top of it the, the European games. So the, the semi-final and the final and the pool stages, there's not a huge gap. And there was a massive gap between this high-end game and the, the next most appropriate high-end game, in a sense. And that game, for me, that in this season, seemed to be to kind of prepare Leinster poorly. 
if that makes any sense. Mm. It's, it sounds like an excuse, but it is a kind of COVID has a reality to it. Now, you could easily say, well, hang on, Saracens, sure, what were they doing? They'd less. But we knew that they had a power game. They were out of their domestic championship for all the reasons we're aware of, and this was huge. And I just felt that Atoje, if, if for those who haven't seen the game, just watch the game, just watch him. Like, you, you, like it, he's a freak. <laughs> like, he's, he's a wing forward. He's, he's like having a Trevor Brennan and putting about two stone on him and Adelaide and, and, and giving him the skill set to play any position he wants to play. And he's just relentless. He's massive. Like he's some of the stuff he did was just off the charts and he led the way. And that's I haven't even mentioned the, the, the Saracens tight head. But I just think that possibly Leinster not having had a European game before this one. Mm. And, the, and the reality is they were playing and they played OK to beat Munster and Ulster and that. But that was poor run in for them. And I think it was a massive lesson and I think they'd be very disappointed in how they allowed yeah. a power game to dominate them because they know that game is there. So I think wow. they'd be really disappointed. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. That said, they had preparation for last year's final and, you know, here we are suddenly again. It feels very similar. Anyway, look, we'll, we'll come back to that again, I suspect. Uh, yesterday, Neil Tracy, Bernard Jackman were in commentary for Toulouse 36, Ulster 8. Cheslin Colby, as you'll hear, did all the damage in the first half. Toulouse getting very close. Thomas Ramos steps out, steps inside two tackles, three tackles before eventually being brought down. Toulouse just five yards out from the try line now. Huge skip pass out onto the far side and Cheslin Colby steps inside Jacob Stockdale and Cheslin Colby is over for a try. It's taken just two and a half minutes and that's a beautiful flick out from Takori. Tentamak and Mavaku and Cheslin Colby now and he steps inside Jacob Stockdale again and Cheslin Colby is over for the second try of the game running in under the post. Absolute magic once again from the South African World Cup winner. Yeah, you know, this is the problem for Ulster is when Toulouse lifted and when they have a little bit of accuracy, they just look devastating. Yeah, 36 points to eight. Uh, we didn't look like a quarterfinal team was Dan McFarlane's uh, summation of that. But I mean, uh, Stuart, Toulouse, their rejuvenation continues. Yeah, I mean, I, say, I thought... I thought all the French teams look a bit rusty. Um, it's very hard for them, having only had two games. But by the end, you, you could see the threat. Um, they're a giant pack, and that's strength in a way. But I, I think Liam will agree later, it's also a weakness. I think Exeter this weekend will have to try and move them around and play. Ulster seemed to be getting it completely wrong. They were so scared about the backs that they wanted to keep it slow and tight. It's not how you play to lose. You've got to move them around and create weaknesses around the fringes. Having said that, you do put yourself under risk every time you kick a ball to someone like Cheslin Colby. Dan McFarlane's comment there, you know, he, he, he recognised that when Toulouse get the ball, as much as any team in Europe, they, they can score a try from anywhere. The, the great and overused world, world, world class. You know, it seems to me, you know, I hear that Charles Piotr is world class for Bristol. He didn't get in the last but one New Zealand World Cup squad. World, world class is like someone who's one of the two best players in the world in his position. And they make gigantic differences to a match. Um, Liam has, has nailed the case for, for Itoje now being a great player uh, on the back of that performance as well as others. And he's absolutely right. And it was a fundamental difference between the teams. Now, if you look at uh, Ulster, they got decent players who are OK there. They're, they're a team of high-class handicappers. And then they come up against Toulouse and they've got arguably the best winger in the world in Cheslin Colby and probably in Antoine Dupont, uh, the only bloke in the world who is going to knock Aaron Smith out of the number nine shirt. They get the ball and things happen from absolutely nowhere. You think you're in contention and suddenly your head's befuddled. I... Toulouse were playing slowly and they were making errors and they were poor. Space of 10 minutes, Colby just comes off his boot. Poor old Jacob Stockdale looks like he doesn't know what country he's in, mm. what time of day it is. But Cheston Colby will do that to anyone against him. And, and they have two great players. I wouldn't say Leinster have one. I, I would probably say the Premiership has one in in. That man, Itoje, it's a rarity. Toulouse have got two of them and it makes them extremely dangerous. Liam, for Ulster, pretty much uh, most things which could go wrong 
uh, did go wrong, certainly in advance. Kutsia didn't play their tallies man, so they went into the game without Addison, uh, Marshall, Kutsia, Tom O'Toole just before kickoff, and then the 6 2 split. It's fair to say when Billy Burns gets injured after 12 minutes, that's backfired quite badly on you. Yeah, I think once like once Kutsia went off the pitch in the Viva there a while back, I think that was Ulster season done because he is, he is whether he would have made a difference against Toulouse or not, I don't know, but he is without doubt their guy who can get go forward. And then you look to likes of Stuart McCluskey in the 12 shirt. Mm. I just, he's a guy you really desperately want to kind of set the park alight. And you, he kind of drifts in and out of fixtures and sometimes some matches he's on fire and other matches he drifts around the place. But he just isn't consistently, for a guy who was an opportunity player for Ireland, he just isn't delivering enough for his team to kind of say, wow, that guy should be playing for Ireland in a sense. Um, you look, you think Ian Henderson, I thought, you know, he's, he's short in match practice, came back from injury and that, and I thought he had he, some sparks. But the ease with which to lose big men could just narrow the Ulster's defence was awe-inspiring you know they were double hitting triple hitting and it gives then as Stuart mentioned one of the best wingers in world rugby if not the best winger and by the way Hugo on the other side wasn't so bad either for his his work grade and what he was doing but you Ulster just kind of concertina in around the ball and got very very narrow and it must have been a joy for for Colby to play and just to really enjoy the ground. Now, you do argue then, you say, listen, our defence, individual defences, but I think it was a capitulation from Ulster that just wasn't able to cope with the level they were playing at, which is, again, but you kind of, you need to frame this one differently, though, because, like, Dan McFarlane getting his side, like, he's on a serious rebuilding of that side. Now, mm. there's question marks over the amount of South Africans and import and Leinster players, like how many actual Ulster players are being fed into this system. That's an argument for another day. But there is a rebuilding going on. And the fact that he did get to the final of the Guinness Pro is a huge fill-up for that organisation and for Dan McFarland. But they've a long way to go if they find themselves a playoff rugby again in Europe to, to try and take on the likes of, of Stad. And Stad aren't the best side in it. Uh, I think this, we're, they're going to they're be... It's going to be an interesting game this weekend that they're facing into. So Ulster are a long way off where they need to be. It's understandable. And I think we should frame it differently than how Leinster went out. Okay, so Racing with uh, Messrs Zebo and Ryan will be keeping an eye on them. Have uh, Saracens in La Defence and Exeter, as you mentioned. There, Stuart have to lose at Sandy Park. Who's going to win this competition outright, Stuart? It's really tough, you know. I, funnily enough, if you said to me one team who won't win it, I would probably say Saracens. I, I think they played so many of their star men so long that mentally and physically that was a huge effort uh, in dublin um Rassin have a big squad they've got some sort of home advantage I, I can't quite work out how much it is but familiarity with your ground does count and there's a few thousand there um and i i just think they might just get caught on the rebound um they might deep down think they've made the point that's a dangerous thing to say because they're an exceptional uh, bunch of fighters um but i would have some confidence in racing winning like i did leinster winning which i got totally wrong um but i i th i think in the wake of that first set quarter final it's going to be very hard for saracens the other one um I was doing a Time Sunday Times pod today and I was being put on the spot with Exeter and Toulouse. And I said, sometimes, what's the point saying who's going to win? Um, because I have no idea between Exeter and Toulouse who's going to win. I, I, it's Exeter's first semi final. They look at a completely different team to how they have. They, they can play at a greater pace. They are at home. Uh, but Toulouse. That extra 80 minutes they played will have helped them a lot. They'll be far less rusty. They've got match winners and they've got four European Cups, which which does count. Um, if it was in Toulouse, I would definitely say Toulouse by about seven points here. I just it's so hard to call. Um, as to winning the tournament, because I can't call Devon, um, I'm going to go Racing, okay. I think. Okay. Liam? Well, whether I like it or not, uh, uh, or I, I can mathematically figure it out. I want Racing to win. Uh, Dunnaker, if for no reason, Simon Zebo obviously at 15 for 
for wrestling. But for Dunica Ryan, like I think it would be an unbelievable story if his contribution to French rugby results in a in a European Cup final win. I'd be absolutely thrilled. So me, all in for wrestling. Okay. And that very last one, uh, Stuart. So, I mean, Mark McCall made the point that, you know, one of the reasons, one of many, I suspect, Saracens were so up for this match at the weekend is that effectively, he said, they were playing to stay together for another week. Uh, so w what is going to happen to Saracens when they, uh, they, they meet their inevitable end here, be that winning this competition or being knocked out? To, to what extent is this whole thing being disbanded? I, I think they've gone through their crisis point. I think the crisis point was when the other 70 points came on top of the 35 to guarantee relegation. Uh, and I think they've handled it extremely well. Um, they would like to have kept Ben Spencer, who's gone to uh, my old clubs and doing great things, changed Bath. Other than that, they've got players going away for a year and coming back. Uh, they're going to get bounced back. It would be lovely to think that the Lions tour would go ahead because it would give a focus at the end of the season to go with any internationals that have played during the 2021 season. Um, we'll have to wait on that one. But if, if, if that happens, Saracens, I, I think, will they'll, obviously they'll walk back up, um, but they will come back and they will come back. And the point to prove will be uh, to win the Premiership immediately again. Uh, and I think they... they I think they've gone through their crisis point. Mm. They have survived, uh, and they showed in Dublin their mettle. Okay. Gents, great to have you with us. Stuart Barnes, always lovely to have you on. Liam Tolan, thanks as ever. Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in.